Hi, I'm Dallas Mayor Eric Johnson, and I want to welcome you to the Dallas Literary Festival here at one of our city's great partner institutions, Southern Methodist University. The theme of this year's festival is, appropriately, turbulence. We all go through turbulence in our lives, and we've endured quite a bit of it in the last year. We've felt pain and sorrow and grief. We're a world that's in anguish, but we're a world that's trying to persevere. Through all that suffering, literature provides us with an outlet. It gives us an escape, a connection, a story that we can engage with and use to understand the complicated world around us. At this festival, you can enjoy readings, interviews, and panels with leading authors, activists, journalists, editors, and agents. Hope you enjoy yourself, build bonds, and learn something new. And we'll see you in person next year. Good evening. This is Gerald Turner, president of SMU, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to SMU Presents, the Dallas Literary Festival. SMU has presented literary festivals for many years. The first one, in fact, was 46 years ago. But it's our opportunity to restart this tradition. But this time, of course, it has to be virtual. Hopefully, we'll be able to be in person again soon. Thank you to our guest writers, over 80 of them, members of the Dallas community and SMU community for participating in this event. And a special thank you goes to Sandaria Faye Smith, Assistant Professor of the Practice of Creative Writing, who organized this whole event. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sandaria Faye Smith, and I'm the Executive Director. It is my honor to welcome you to the virtual Dallas Literary Festival, presented by Southern Methodist University. This year's theme is turbulence. We've all been experiencing the turbulence of the coronavirus, being quarantined, and racial inequality. But I do see a ray of hope. Part of that hope is this literary festival. And this year, over the next three days, we have gathered Pulitzer Prize winners, the U.S. Poet Laureate, and highly talented local authors. We have two amazing keynote speakers in Mitchell Jackson and Alice Marie Johnson. We are honoring our local talent, Ben Fountain and activist Emma Rogers. And you will hear from our Teenage Literary Contest winner. I would like to express my thanks to the Dallas literary community and the local and national organizations that help make this event possible. Without you, we would not be here. Now to get this literary festival started, I would like to introduce to you the chair of the English department at Southern Methodist University, Daryl Dixon Carr. Again, welcome to the virtual Dallas Literary Festival and thank you for attending. Well, good evening, everyone. And I want to thank Sandria Smith for the fantastic work she has done in organizing this really amazing festival. Um, we've been looking forward to this for months. Um, she has put an enormous amount of work into the festival um, and it is in some ways almost unprecedented in its scope. Um, and we are absolutely amazed at the job that she has done. Um, I think you're going to really enjoy all of the events this weekend and you will learn a great deal as uh, Mayor Johnson indicated. And we at SMU are very glad to have all of you here and participating in this wonderful event. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, the speakers at tonight's opening keynote event. Um, and um, I really look forward to hearing the conversation that they're going to have tonight. So first I'm going to introduce um, Alice Marie Johnson, who is the CEO of Taking Action for Good Foundation and an author, an advocate and former federal inmate who has become a renowned leader, speaker, and luminary in the criminal justice reform movement. Since being granted clemency and more recently a full pardon, Alice has committed her life to helping others and continuing to fight for criminal justice reform for the women and men who are still incarcerated. Through her leadership of TAG, 
Alice has devoted herself as a force for good, creating a cultural shift for restorative justice. Her memoir, After Life, was published almost a year ago. Her story has inspired many. And we are fortunate to have her sharing her experiences with us tonight. In conversation with Ms. Johnson will be Mitchell S. Jackson, author of the highly acclaimed and award-winning book, The Residue Years, which explores his hometown of Portland, Oregon, his community, his family, and his early life. Jackson's newest work is Survival Math, Notes on an All-American Family, a hybrid nonfiction, part essay, part memoir, part history, which serves as a cultural critique of the racial history of Oregon, American whiteness, mass incarceration, sex work, violence, and broken families, phenomena with which Jackson is intimately familiar and ultimately presents a microcosm of the forces blighting the lives of untold disenfranchised Americans. I know I'm looking forward to the dialogue to come during the, our keynote. Please join me in welcoming Alice Marie Johnson and Mitchell Jackson. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this festival. I am truly honored to be here today. So thank you. I'm looking forward to all of the events today and I'm looking forward to sharing some of my parts of my story and insights into what has happened in this age of mass incarceration. Uh, I'm honored to be here and thank you to Sandria and, and all of the uh, people who are responsible for making this uh, event happen. Um, I love coming and visiting Dallas and uh, I can't think of a more fitting uh, institution than me having this this uh, literary festival, and I'm I'm really thankful to be uh, sharing this um, this opportunity with you, uh, Alice. I, I feel like I'm I'm kinfolk already now because I I've been I've been reading about you and have, and have read the books, so uh, I feel very close to you. You know, those people run up on you after they didn't read your book, like, oh, you're my cousin. Like I would be one of those people if we were uh, not doing this virtually. Um, I thought what we would do since we're both authors. Um, is maybe read a little bit uh, from our books, uh, just something really short. And I prepared uh, a, a, just a few minutes to read from Survival Man. I don't really want to do a long setup, but what I will say is that this is a letter, uh, an imaginary letter written to the first person who ever stepped foot in what became Oregon, which is my home state. It's a guy named Marcus Lopez. And this was 1788. So this is me writing to Marcus about what has happened between 1788 and then when I left uh, up to present time, Oregon. Uh, so I'll just read this little section. Um, the day after my 13th birthday, a carload of bloods murdered Ray Ray Winston, the city's inaugural gang homicide. Reporters interviewed Ray Ray's mama the next day, broadcasted her standing outside the projects in a shower cap and black jacket with a microphone punched at her shoulder. He was well loved by everybody, she explained. He didn't mess with nobody. They showed Ray Ray's high school hoop coach with a mess of hair under a baseball cap and sunglasses hanging from the neck of his t-shirt. He'd be the kind of boy you'd want for a son, he said. Then there was a spectacle of young Ray Ray's funeral, police blocking all access roads to the church, police questioning drivers, police conducting targeted searches of pe people making their way for the entrance, a procession of mourners filling into the church, among them a dude wearing suspended slacks and a white shirt, somebody's grandpa in mutton chop sideburns and a shark skin suit, a woman wearing a leisure curl and an ankle length dress, youngsters in their Sunday best, and hella Crips, there to support their fallen comrade, Crips sporting rags tied over their heads and lokes, Crips donning blue plaid shirts single buttoned at the throat, Crips wearing sweatshirts with the words R.I.P. Ray Ray Loke ironed on the back, and another Crips set marching into the church. Ray Ray's death heralded our, the hour being my cohorts and I, Enduring love affair with colors serve as proof we become mortal threats to each other. But that same year, the second coming of the KKK known as skinheads also proved baleful. A few decades later, Northeast Portland 
we christened it the NEP or the town. And Marcus, had you been born again and lived among us tenderfoot NEP dwellers, we might have called you OG or big homie or big bro mm -hmm. or family or family or cutty or partner. All that work that we put in has begot errors of big homies and little homies and gang heroes and gang villains and funerals of big homies and little homies and heroes and villains and innocents that include crowds so large they spill out of an Avenue Baptist church and into the street. The NEP, the town, demands ample faith in dozens upon dozens of places to worship. We also homage the rose, the rose garden, the rose quarter, rose bushes in the yards of homes in the West Hills, in neighborhoods where developers build or open to the public a new street of dreams every year, a street that is for someone else's dreams. Because the truth is some of us dream, but smart to far too many dream small, realistic. And when those young dreams desert us, some of us start demanding by force things that ain't ours. Others move to Vegas, pimp, purchase a new ride and voyage home with the intent on triumph from the up and down MLK. Those who stay local, those with aspirations average as shit, plus abandoned faith, covered restored muscle cars with custom systems, exotic paint, and wire rims with too many spokes to count. Others, oh boy, was this me, cop a sack from a big homie, a pre-cooked and acetone cut underweight dope sack and stand on a street grown folks warned us away from. Corners where young boys whose quivering flames were doused previous to ours carry stolen straps and heavy grudges against the world. We posted on hot blocks all night for damn near nothing, only half of which, if we were lucky, was ours to keep. This was our cosmos, the reason there's been a hell of a chance of finding who we've been looking for in the Justice Center, if for months we ain't seen them on the streets. Uh, so that's my part of my letter to, to Marcus. Uh, and I am really looking forward to hear what Alice is going to share with us. Thank you so much, Mitchell. I decided I wanted to share with you the moment, the timing, so that you could feel some of what I felt the day that I was handed down a terrible sentence of life without the possibility of parole. Ironically, this year marks the 50th year anniversary of the war on drugs that President Nixon declared in 1971, which has incarcerated more of our family members. You said we could be family members. Yeah. And I both had a lot of family members who are still incarcerated in what we consider really and truly modern day slavery. Because of the mandatory sentencing laws, Judge Gibbons had no leeway in sentencing. The crimes of which I'd been con convicted carried life in prison. We could have all seen this coming since it was a pre-sentencing report, but because of denial or ignorance or simply not understanding the criminal justice system, I only now understood the gravity of my situation. I had entrusted my life to my legal counsel without fully understanding the stakes that the laws around my sentence were non-negotiable. Furthermore, there would not even be a chance for me to redeem myself at a parole hearing because the federal system has no parole. I had just received an unexecuted sentence of death. I let the word spread out in my head before reacting. I'll never forget the collective gasp that, that came from the courtroom. It was a breathy mis mixture of both disbelief and anguish. And after that, 
horrible sound, nothing. Just silence for one beat, then two, then a sound much worse than the gasp, weeping. I didn't look back at my elderly parents. I knew the sound of crying was coming from my dad, the hardworking man who gotten up early to milk the cows, helped us pick cotton, then secretly built a house with his own hands so we could have a better life than sharecropping. I couldn't bear to see the man who baptized me in the muddy lake sobbing. I seen him cry in church while praying, but this was different, raw grief. Next to him sat my mother, that strong woman who raised me on blackberry cobbler and the soaring words of Martin Luther King Jr. This was not how any of us had expected my life to turn out. I was trying to hold my tears in check, to swallow them down. I wanted to cry, to scream. I felt like my head would explode, my throat burn, but I didn't want to lose control of myself in this moment. I would apparently have plenty of time to process this. However, I think it angered Judge Gibbons that I didn't break down and cry. She was still talking and I forced myself to listen to her words. She was recommending I spend my life sentence at a prison in Texas called Carswell because they had a mental health department. She looked at me unkindly and said, you will need a mental health facility as you come to grips with your life sentence. My head snapped and I met her eyes. The insinuation was insulting that I'd be so weak that I'd end up with mental health issues. You'll lose your mind before I lose mine, I thought. When I was walking out with my hands cuffed, I had to pass my family I turned to look at them and I faced them. It's going to be okay, I tried to tell them. I wanted them to know this was not the end. This was something I felt strongly, even in that moment of chaos. On the way out the door, the court reporter, Joe Moore stopped me. Ms. Johnson, he said, it's going to be okay. You aren't going to do all that time. I paused to look at his eyes. Why would he say such a thing at a time like this? Yet his words stuck with me. There's one more small passage that I want to add. And this was the morning. Some things that happened on my very first day in prison, in federal prison. People had warned me so much that I was going to be with the big girls. Now I was in federal prison. I'd gotten cowed, but it was less intimidating than I anticipated. This low security prison was built on the Eastern edge of the town and was in an old army post nestled into the mountains. I was expecting a concrete and steel prison like you might see on television. Though the walls did have razor wire, FCI Dublin had more green spaces and flowers than I expected. And one particularly pretty patch of pansies was a sign that read, no inmates allowed beyond this point. The pansies were a bright spot of color in an otherwise drab environment. I was led into the lobby area to a large desk. When I walked in, conversation stopped. All eyes were on me as everyone checked out the new arrival. After this pregnant moment, everyone went back to their chattering. This pattern repeated itself with each new prison. I later learned this happened for two reasons. Each prison had the capacity to be real trouble. Each prisoner, I'm sorry, had the capacity to be real trouble. So everyone made a quick assessment before going back to work. But also some were checking out the women for possible new relationships. The prisoners called new arrivals fresh fish or fresh, fresh other things. A woman came up to me with a welcome pack that included a toothbrush and toothpaste, shower gel and a prison soap. You'll be needing these, she said in a thick accent. 
Though I was trying to act normal, she could tell I was out of my element. Is this your first time? I nodded before I was handed prison clothes. I was shuffled from one place to another. Though this was one of the more traumatic days of my life, the officers who were handling me were not, were just doing their jobs. They saw people coming into prison all the time. So they chatted with each other casually laughing about their life and plans. I want to just fast forward just a little bit further into that day. This is when I walked into a crowd listening to a woman at the front holding a piece of paper and emoting as she read. As I was sitting there, I marveled at poetry existed even in a federal prison, a little pop of beauty the officers hadn't extinguished. But I couldn't very well pay attention to the poems. My mind began to wonder. I'd never been so far away from my family in all my life, and they didn't even know where I was or how far away I had traveled. I must have looked lost because a woman in a wheelchair rolled up beside me. What's your name, she asked, taking my hand. Alice Johnson. I replied, Alice, she said, as if she enjoyed the way my name rolled off her tongue. Then she looked at me squarely in the face and lowered her voice. Bloom where you're planted, she said. God knows where you are. We stared at each other for a minute. Then she squeezed my hand, releasing me from the trance. As I walked away, I just kept repeating the notion in my mind. Bloom where you're planted. God knows where you are. Sure, this was a trite saying, a platitude, but for some reason, her words were exactly what I needed to hear at exactly the right moment. I stopped dragging my feet. Her words gave me a pep in my step. I'm so glad you read that part. I just want to show something to you. I don't know if you can see this very well, but you see all these little tabs. These are my markings. And that, I underlined and starred that line, bloom where you're planted. Uh, so that was a line that really stuck with me. Uh, and it stuck with me because it felt like wisdom. Um, and, you know, I think when you go down, I don't know how many people know much about my story, but I did a little bit of time in the state uh, prison for selling drugs and it it almost is like I'm kind of scared to mention it around people who've done what I call real time um, but one of the things I think I was trying to figure out as a young person I was 20 early 20s when I went down was like where was the wisdom in the institution like who do you listen to who do you not listen to whose wisdom is just a facet of them being incarcerated and like who is actually trying to change their life. Um, and it seemed like that was a piece of wisdom that you got very early on that was uh, of benefit to you. And I wonder how did you negotiate, you know, cause there's plenty of people who don't have this, who aren't trying to help you, who, who don't want to give you something that's going to give you peace or solitude or something. So how did you negotiate you know, the people who were, had wisdom to give you, who were kind versus trying to figure out how to kind of stay, stay away from the other people or to survive those other kind of um, intentions? Well, of course, there were many examples of why I wanted to stay away from those who we call troublemakers. Mm -hmm. When you got into trouble in federal prison, there were too many things that you lost Keeping in close contact with my family was very important. Mm -hmm. One of the things that happened to me when I was first sent away to prison, I was sent 1,500 miles away from my family. I remember looking at that play, looking out of the window, and with every mile, I knew that I was getting farther and farther away from my family. And so to, to go the other path and to not have any kind of hope and just decide that, well, I'm doing life anyway. Mm -hmm. What difference does it make if I get in trouble? Yeah. That was not an option for me because I didn't want to lose loss of visits. I didn't want to lose loss of my telephone privileges. I didn't want to lose loss when emails finally came of just having communication with my family. Because even though I was incarcerated, 
that does not change who I was. I was still a mother. I was still a sister. I was still a friend. I was still a daughter. So I wanted to stay in con close contact with my family. Mm -hmm. And for me, seeking out those who had the more positive things to sow into my life was a necessity. Mm -hmm. But I also knew that because I was not one of the younger ones who came into prison. Mm -hmm. I came into prison at 41. So I was not a teenager and I came out at 63. So many of the young people, Mitchell, they look to me for wisdom. They look to me for guidance. Yeah. And I, I never shunned anyone, no matter who they, who they were, what trouble they had been in. I felt that it was very important for me to impart wisdom and to, to sow into their lives, to help them along their path. Because I knew that I had, I had children myself that were the ages of many of these young people. One of the things that I used to always pray because one of my youngest son, he also went to prison while I was in prison. Mm -hmm. Know that many, many parents end up, their children take that path, even though we went for totally different reasons. But he was the only one who was a teenager when I went to prison. His mm -hmm. father was no longer in his life and he didn't have the, the same benefit that my other children had of having a parent there doing a very important time in his life as he was going through his teenage years. And so he did what many other children of the incarcerated do. He's drawn toward the streets himself. Mm -hmm. And he ended up becoming my pen pal. My son oh. became wow. my pen pal. That whole, that whole thing of the generational, but that generational curse in the, is broken. It will be broken. It is broken. But he also had dreams of going to college. My other three children attended college. They're college educated. But this one, who was still a teenager, as I've said, he fell through the cracks. Yeah. He was dropped. He was dropped. And it was, he was, someone did pick him back up. But, yeah. but, but for, for me, it was very important. I used to pray that the things that I'm giving out, please, Lord, send someone in my son's pathway to mm. give out to him and to sow into his life and to help mentor him. So having a child that was incarcerated really gave me, spurred me on even more to be a positive influence in the lives of the women who I was incarcerated with. Yeah. You know, um, you didn't, I don't think you mentioned this, you talked about your family, which really intrigued me. And if my History and my math is right. You were born the same year Emmett Till was murdered. Yes. Um, and you also were born in Mississippi. And uh, last week I was listening to uh, Nina Simone's uh, Goddamn Mississippi, which I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that tune, but it's like Nina, I'm saying like I know her, Simone um, being exasperated with Mississippi of all the Southern states, right? Like, so she mentions Alabama, she mentions, I think, uh, Tennessee, but then she's like, but Mississippi, like there's just something about it. And I wonder, um, you know, why do you think that Mississippi is so infamous in our kind of vision of Southern, Southern states? And then also you all managed to kind of create a life for yourself. Um, you know, your father went from a sharecropper, your mother, uh, ended up a, a business person, right? And they were very respected members in the community. So it's not like there was no opportunity for people in Mississippi. But when I think of Mississippi, I, I sometimes I'm like, goddamn Mississippi myself. So I wondered if you could talk about that, how it kind of looms large for us and why you think that might be. And then how you were able to, your family was able to kind of navigate that uh, when you were, were coming up. Well, I come from a very strong family. As you said, my father was a sharecropper, my mother cooked, and she used those abilities, that talent she had for making everything so flavorful, as they said, make you want to slap your mama. Yeah. <laughs> but my mother, that is literally the way that we were able to come out of poverty in Mississippi. My mm. mother used her cooking skills to become literally famous in Mississippi as a renowned cook, chef, until she realized her own dream and vision 
by cooking, by catering, by doing other things. And it was in that hard press. It is in the hard places, in the hard place that character is built and that we become strong. As they say, a butterfly, it is a struggle that causes that caterpillar to be able to break through those walls and become a butterfly. And I know that it was the struggle, the things that I experienced in Mississippi that prepared me to, to not only survive, but excel and help bring people out of bondage in prison, both mental bondage, physical and spiritual bondage while I was in prison. But it was a strong Mississippi faith. Now my parents both were strong, was a strong woman and man of faith and we were strong also. But they, it was out of the things that they could dream. My, my parents always taught us that nothing can contain a dreamer. Nothing can hold a dream back. Prison, could, prison walls couldn't contain my dream. It could not kill my spirit. And I think it was in that hard place of growing up in Mississippi that prepared me to be strong while I was in prison. And you know, ironically, Mitchell, Mississippi, it's not the Mississippi that you might think of from years ago. Mm. In fact, I'm headed back to Mississippi to make my home there. Mm. That's how much Mississippi has changed. So, you know, many people don't know the new Mississippi. You do have the sons and daughters and grandchildren of those who were part of the whole segregation mm. period. The sons and daughters of the Klansmen that wore the hoods. Mm. But one thing I found out, you don't have to be racist, does not identify you by wearing a hood. At right. least you recognize who your enemy was. There yeah. were enemies, as we say up north, that didn't wear the hoods, but were just as bad. So, you know, that's part of our turbulent past. I'm, I'm headed into a brand new Mississippi that has a bright future. There's no way that I'd be going back to the same Mississippi but I'm headed into a much more progressive Mississippi, a Mississippi that I would say is on the move and on the rise of doing great things. And I'm hoping to be a contributor. In fact, I know I'm going to be a contributor to a new, the new Mississippi that is now emerging. And it's really a great place to live now. It's a great place to raise your family. And I would really encourage even the authors of the song and you too, Mitchell. <laughs> Yeah, to come on back down to Mississippi and check us out. Okay, okay. Um, you know, I just your 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 enthusiasm and your hope is in, infectious, and I can just I I get it. I see you smiling. I, I'm I'm looking for the go to, but I ain't going I'm not gonna say smile too wide. Go to You know. Okay. What all you. right. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry about the go to, but um. You know, uh, there's a moment where you are incarcerated. I think it's pretty early on. Wait, no, no, it's not. There's a moment towards the end where you think you might, I'm jumping way far ahead now, right? You think you might get clemency and you are with, you know, you've been going back and forth and you are with three other, two other women and the warden calls you down, all three of you, and you all think that you're about to get clemency because of the way in which you've been called down and you've seen this happen before. And one goes in and comes out and she's disappointed. And then you go in thinking that you're gonna be granted clemency and it's a, 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 a media, um, media opportunity, mm -hmm. requ a media request. Yeah, and then, and then the other woman gets it, right? And so you are rightfully disheartened in that moment, right? You've been working up to this moment, you think it's, a, but, in that moment, you say that the warden was a nice woman. It wasn't like you like she shouldn't have called us all three down there, but she's kind of like a nice woman. So maybe she didn't mean no harm by it. And in my head, I was like, hell no, that's malicious um, because she had to know if she had been doing this for years, she would have known how other people had been granted clemency around the time that you all were had applied for. Like she would have known these things. So she would have known that it seems to me she would have known that what she was doing was instilling you with that hope only to say, hey, do you want to go on KOTV or whatever? Um, which made me think about this kind of, yeah, about this kind of hopefulness that you had and like 
Um, how did you maintain that? And do you think that it ever served you wrong in those instances where it, like it could have maybe guarded you against some disappointment in those kind of moments? Well, actually, I'm, I'm going to be honest. The person, the warden that called me up there, the associate warden who called me up, up there, I think she was clueless, really. Okay. She was calling people. She was just trying to do a job and mm -hmm. her to get this piece out of the way. And it was time saving for her without even thinking about the emotions that myself and the other woman would experience by being called up there. And she tells one to stay. It was as if I'm, it was emotionless almost because she was pretty nice, but it was emotional. It's like I got three things that I need to call three women up here for instead of calling them one at a time. Let me just get them up here because my time is precious without yeah. realizing that she has shattered us. But something very interesting happened to Mitchell. I have to just bring this point out. Mm -hmm. The one who actually did receive clemency, she had a life sentence just as I did. And her clemency was only reduced from life to 30 years. She didn't receive a full clemency. And there were too many people who didn't receive full clemencies during that whole process. Mm -hmm. But she actually saw me walk out of the door. Mm -hmm. She was still there when I left for my freedom. So as the word of God tells us, Romans 8, 28. And that just so happened to be the day that I was granted a full pardon was August the eighth month and the 28th day. And I was yeah. always quoting that scripture that, and we know that all things work together for the good, for those who love God and I'll be called according to his purpose. So for me, hope, I couldn't allow anyone to take my hope from me. If a person does not have hope, what do you have at that point then, Mitch? What do you have? So right. I had to, I had, I held on to my hope for dear life. And really when I went to prison, I really made my own self a promise that I was never going to lose my hope, even though it was hard. Some days would kick my behind that I want to crawl up under the bed and just stay there. I'd be lying to you if I told you I never cried or I didn't feel that pain. I was always smiles. I cried. Mm. I cried many a days, but I didn't let myself stay in that place because then I would be the defeated. Because without hope, what do you have? What do we have? And really hope that is seen is not even hope at all. We have to keep on hoping for those things when we can't see them. Once we see them, then it's no longer hope. Yeah. Um, okay. So I have another moment where I think that your positivity comes through. Um, I, I don't know if I'm saying his name right. The prosecutor, is it Canali? Am I saying that? Yes, Stuart Canali. Okay, Canali. So you are vying for, for clemency. Uh, your family and, and, your, and your advocates are really pressing. They finally get through to this guy. And um, he tells your daughter, like, you, your daughter's telling him, like, look at all the things that my mother has done. You know, she's on TV. She's mentoring people. She's doing all of this good in the world. And he's like, basically, oh, this is also the guy who has been stamping denied on all your requests for clemency. He says, oh, yeah, I, every time her file comes across, I just stamp denied on it. Like, I don't even, oh, he hasn't even been paying attention to the person whose life he is sentenced to death in a, in a prison. So there's, there's, there's that. But then he says, she's telling him all this wonderful stuff you've done. And then he says, yeah, but what I need from her is an apology. I need her to write an apology. And I'm like, an apology? Like, she's been down over 10 years and doing all this good work. And what you think makes her deserving of freedom is an apology? To, to whom? Um, so I wondered about this because I also think about this kind of, you know, when we talk about mass incarceration, we talk about restorative justice, we talk about truth and reconciliation. Right. And I wonder what is the role of the apology in restorative justice and in truth and reconciliation? And if you can even connect it to that moment, too. I don't know if your dad, I'm sure she told you about that. Like, what were you thinking? He was like, apology. Yes, really. I think it's part of control. It's say sorry. I think my actions in themselves said sorry. Yeah. The fact of the, as they called, incredible things that I had done are totally rehabilitated life it didn't take a life sentence for me to learn my lesson yeah. Mitch, i was a first time nonviolent offender who'd never been in trouble before 
And because of that one thing called conspiracy that makes you accountable for everything that everyone else does in the case, I, I received the, really the harshest sentence. It was two of us that received that harsh sentence. But I think more of what he wanted me to do was apologize for fighting him because I fought hard in a six week trial. In fact, my judge called me one of the most arrogant women that had ever been in her courtroom, but it wasn't arrogant that she wanted to call me. It was uppity, but mm. daring to stand up and say, I'm going to fight because many, many people take a plea because they're so afraid of the system. So they take a plea just, if they may not even be guilty. I know I wasn't guilty about those things they were accusing me of. I did some wrong stuff, but I shouldn't do all that. Mm -hmm. But what can you do? And that's really highlights one of the big flaws in clemency is that why would you ask the very person who you've been in, in an adversarial relationship with, like the prosecutor, as to, well, do you think I should let her go home? He don't know anything about me. He's still thinking about me from 20 years ago when I had to be told to sit down because I jumped up and said, I object because my attorney wouldn't object. So he's still thinking about that Alice Johnson who would fight you, who fought tooth and nail, but who wouldn't fight for their freedom. And so people, many prosecutors will get mad because of of what you've done, uh, because of maybe the crime or that you fought. So their reasoning for wanting you to stay there is not justice. It has nothing to do with whether or not you should be set free. It's still on a revenge mode. And that's something that really needs to change. Why not ask the warden what she thinks about this person? The warden wrote a wonderful letter for me yeah. telling about all the incredible things I've done and asking for me to be saying why I should be set free and rejoin my family. So why are you asking a prosecutor who hadn't seen me in almost a quarter of a century why I, whether or not he thinks I should come home? And for that to hold so much sway and so much weight in the clemency process is in itself wrong. So when people say that they want you to say, I'm sorry, so many times it has something else underlying with it. And not, not so much sorrow, but bow down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't even know how to broach this, but uh, I, I, you know, Obama is a hero, right? To black people in general. I mean, a hero to, to, to the diaspora all over the world. Um, but, you know, I read your book and I get, you know, towards the end and I, and I see what kind of personal struggle you're going through to try to get out. And uh, um, I see, uh, let me back up. You all were watching um, the election, 2016 election mm -hmm. in uh, while you were incarcerated. And I thought that was really interesting because I don't remember, and I wasn't, I was only down for 16 months. So I don't really have that, you know, long experience. And I don't, there was no election, but I don't remember any kind of political conversations happening while I was incarcerated. I don't remember anyone talking about an election. I certainly don't remember us watching any kind of election. And I thought it was really interesting that you all were so uh, involved in or astute on what was happening. And some of the women were doing it, I think, because they wanted to, um, they thought that if, if, if Clinton was elected, like she would somehow, it would somehow trickle down to them and they might be able to get out sooner. So I can see that, you know, maintaining that kind of audacious hope um, but then I wondered, uh, you know, like, how, why do you think that you all were even talking about politics in, in that space? Um, was it, a, was it, and you moved around a little bit in the feds too, was it a particular place that this was happening or was it, uh, something else? Well, actually, uh, we had a huge TV room and it was filled to capacity. Mm -hmm. Every election, every debate, I watched every debate. Mm -hmm. I tried to know what was happening because really, if you think about it, Major, whoever would sit in that position could very well hold the key that could set us free. Yeah. And also, we were interested in how they felt about criminal justice reform, okay. where they, what, they, what their position was on it. 
So I was very attuned to things that were taking place and what the candidates were running on. Uh, my family was very attuned into what the candidates' platform was. I don't think it's very many prisoners who don't, whose family are not very interested in what the politicians feel about criminal justice reform if they have a loved one who's incarcerated. So mm -hmm. we were really, we were really laser focused on that election because it had been an election like I had never in my lifetime seen. Yeah. I'd never seen an election like that before. Uh, so it was, it was something else. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting because I think when we're on the street, uh, I'll speak for myself and 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 the, and the young people that I were young people with me. Uh, we didn't have political conversations, and also we I'm talking about coming of age in the 1994 crime bill. So you might you might know because you someone you've seen has got a violent crime and they you know get a mandatory minimum. So you know that this thing exists, but you don't connect this. Um, piece of legislation to your personal experience, mm -hmm. right? And so it's a shame. It's shameful because we're out here operating in a world in which these laws are actually directed at us, mm -hmm. but we are oblivious to these laws until we catch the case, right? Um, yeah. So I, and I, but then it's interesting because then you get inside and you're saying that everyone becomes more politically active, but it also seems like once we get out, that political activism kind of uh, recedes a little bit for, for a lot of people. And if it didn't, then we would have a lot more sway on what was, right. what was happening. So maybe there's, you know, obviously there's a lot of different people advocating for reinstating people's voting rights. And, you know, we are now in an era where they're trying to take away so many of our rights in, in so many different states. Um, but yeah, I, I just thought about that, like the, the political activism and the, and the political engagement, how it was heightened in prison. Right. Um, and that seemed really, really uh, remarkable to me. And you know, for me, it, uh, it was heightened in prison more so, but even growing up, my mother was very, very much into politics. Mm -hmm. uh, she was very, very much a leading figure with the NAACP. And she would always be right there if you wanted to know something that was going on. So at our dinner table, we talked about politics too. So I grew up in a household that was very interested in what was going on in our little city and in our nation too. And, mm -hmm. since, and since I've been out, that has been, I mean, that's been a really big focus of mine, focus of my organization, a focus of everything. When I walked out of that door, and I made that promise when I ran across, before I ran across that road. <laughs> <laughs> I did make a promise to the women and to the men who I'd never seen, who I hadn't seen, that I would never forget about them and I would never stop fighting for them. And, you know, for someone who has spent a long time in prison, um, you can't just walk away. That was a third of my life I spent in prison. Yeah. And so you can't just walk away. I could just walk away and act as if I hadn't been touched. I could erase that, those over two decades of my life behind bars. And there would be times, honestly, that I would feel so guilty about even enjoying things in life because I thought about people who were still incarcerated, who I was no better than them, but they just didn't get the same opportunity that I had. So I, I felt very strongly that I had to be a voice for them and wherever I have the opportunity to speak about them, I, if I tell my story, I'm telling their story. If they, as I say, if they see my face, you see in the face of countless thousands upon thousands of people whose faces you may never see. So I feel, I've always, I've said this, I feel like it's my, not only a responsibility, but it's a sacred duty to get out and do it. So many people that I fought for who are still incarcerated. And, you know, it's overwhelming sometimes. And, I'm having to learn some type of balance in my life because I haven't even taken a break. I haven't taken a vacation and I, I, I've got to, that's why I'm moving back to Mississippi where most of my family is. I really owe it to myself and to my family to, to reunite and reconnect with them. And I won't be slowing my pace down, but I'll just be creating some different moments now. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to ask you about time too. Um, you know, uh, and, and what doing 
a lot of time does to your sense of time? Like, does it, um, does it make you more like anxious or does it give you more patience? Um, does it, is it a different way that you see time when you are in, like, you know, let's say don't count your days, don't look at calendars, all those things. But then in the world, like, do you feel like you're making up for time or do you feel like you have more patience now? I think I have more patience. And one thing I've learned is to literally live in the moment. I wasn't living in the moment before I went to prison. Mm. Time passed more crazy for me when, when I was a free person. Time becomes different. You don't mark time the same way as a person who's lost their freedom, who's never lost their freedom before. Mm. I literally live in the moments that I'm in and learn to so many things. I just looked over here at this window I saw there's a little lake outside my window and some birds were flying around out there. Mm-hmm. I enjoy things now that I took for granted. And so I don't mark time. I don't look at time as to I've got to make up for time. I learned that early on. You can never make up for something that you have lost, but you can redeem the time that you're in. You can mm-hmm. learn to live in those moments that you're in right now. So, you know, honestly, I have a deeper appreciation now for life, for family, for time. Because even even when we've had to go on lockdown during this pandemic, and we've had to, I'm gonna say, be locked up in our houses into our spaces, it didn't seem the same for me as it probably seemed for most of the world because I've been locked up before. And um, I've learned how to survive and exist, survive in, in those type of moments. But with this, I could see, I see I had the freedom to do something I still can't get over doing. And uh, this picking up, I talk on the phone too much because in, in prison, we only had a 15 minute call and 200 yeah. minutes a month. So I can pick that phone up and I can have, my daughter said she probably was going to have to beat me off the phone when I first got off. <laughs> she said she was going to put me on phone restriction because I was on the phone, FaceTime it. I could do <laughs> whenever I wanted to. So I made up with some of this, some of this things that we've had to face as a country and as a world by mm-hmm. staying connected to my family even more so than when I was incarcerated. And I didn't let, I didn't let that way to where it would, and as I, as I said in my book, my judge thought that I would lose my mind having to come to grips with spending, you know, with having that I was never coming home. Mm-hmm. And I, I made a conscious effort to, if I found myself getting too anxious, I would make, I would find peace within my own self, really. I find that place of peace because I didn't want to lose my mind. I think about, oh no, I'm not losing my mind. So doing this whole thing of being uh, sheltered in in this pandemic, I have found some different things that I've been able to do. And uh, just wait till I take the lid off of them. <laughs> that was a very creative time for me too, because yeah. I don't, I don't, as I say, I don't mark time like that. Time is so precious to me. And, and that's one thing I try to make sure that I'm not just losing time anymore. It's very precious to me, but I'm not anxious about it either. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your daughter. Uh, you know, you talk prominently about your kids in the book, especially early on, and um, that you come from a really big family. I think you have, is it nine of you? Six, yeah. Nine altogether? Four. Uh-huh. It was eight yeah. Years. And um, and I was thinking about this role of the family and the role that quote unquote a broken family has, you know, like we talked, like my mother actually did a little time in prison when I was, I don't know, in middle school uh, age. And I, you know, I didn't have a, a, a my father, my biological father in my life at that time. So, you know, I'm like the kind of poster child for the broken home in that sense. Uh, but then also, you come from a family that was not broken, mm-hmm. right? And then, and then we end up in a in a similar kind of situation. I think it's interesting. I didn't. I never told you this. Um, that we went to prison just months apart. You went to prison in March of 1997. I went to prison June 13th, 1997. It was a Friday the 13th. Uh, you know those kind of dates that you don't you don't forget. No. Um, but yeah, I was just wondering about what do you think about the role of the family? in mass incarceration and particularly this notion of the broken family? Well, 
I think that you will find more people probably in prison who did come from broken homes, but you know, I'm going to speak in terms of African Americans. Mm. Um, that's because that's all I can give you my experience from is from a black family. Yeah. And black families, the mothers, and I'm not trying to try to disrespect the fathers. There are many families who have a strong black mother and they don't go to prison. I never thought I would end up in prison. So it just tells you, shows you, but it was not because of my family upbringing that I went to prison. It was doing a very hard crisis in my life. Uh, a time of you can you can associate prison with poverty because I did go through a very, very rough time in my life and I made a very bad decision out of desperation that I look back and I wonder why in the world did I do that? You know, you we do things sometimes out of desperation, but that don't mean that that's who you are. But I, I go back to it there. You will find a coalition between broken families and more incarcerated uh, persons, and um, honestly, especially uh, young black men who haven't had a role model, mm-hmm. you won't find uh, that's that will be the biggest ratio when there was not a father or someone. Don't even have to be a father. It could be an uncle. It could be a friend. It could be a church member. It could be a teacher who helps mentor a young man that helps him with a different path. But you can really cha- uh, trace poverty to a lot of our incarceration problem. Yeah. Uh, speaking of role model, uh, we have some Q&A, some questions from, from the audience. And one of them mentions um, Brian Stevenson. Uh, and the question here is, um, did you see Just Mercy or read Just Mercy? Uh, and you're curious about what you think about the work that Brian, uh, Brian Stevenson is doing. Oh, that work he's doing is, I, I can't even give him enough claps or kudos or anything else. I think the work he's doing is incredible. He could have taken any path and maybe have been a big corporate lawyer, anything he wanted, but he chose to go back and try to save the lives of others. That became his passion. That became his mission. And look at the lives he has changed. If it was just one that he had saved his life, then he could he could go and say, I saved a life, but he has not. And his the thing that he will leave behind, the legacy that he will leave behind, and also what he has done for families is just incredible. I love Bryce. I love him. He is, he's a hero. Okay. Uh, I think Daryl is jumping in with some more questions. Yeah, I'll, I just want to, first of all, just thank both of you for, for this dialogue. Uh, we thought that would be that would be a good time to um, start answering more of the questions that are in the Q&A, and, and, um, um, and I'll just proceed to try to get through as many of these as possible. Um, some of them are addressed to both of you. Um, uh, some are addressed uh, directly to, to, to one of you. So I'll just ask them and, um, and feel free to um, um, answer as you, as you please. Uh, the first question in the Q&A, and I think this is to both of you, is, is how do you become a name as a writer? Uh, well, I became a name because my story was so uh, widespread. It received international attention. Um, and really, for me, my, I, I guess a little bit different for me because there was already name recognition with me because of the way that I came out on such a, a miraculous and incredible platform. Um, I didn't have a name, and I don't even know how much of a name I have now, uh, but I can tell you anyone that wants to be a writer needs to put in the work. Yes. Uh, and that begins with the reading, that begins with learning the craft. Um, I actually think that thinking about becoming a name writer is probably uh, not the greatest objective, depending on where you are in your um writing trajectory like if you already have a couple of books out and you think like they're just not giving you a fair shake out in the marketplace I think that's one thing but if you are just getting started um, I would really I think the better question is how do I become the strongest possible writer that I can be Uh, because the the marketing and the promotion 
is, uh, is, is secondary and not necessarily even done by, by the writers. So um, I don't know who that anonymous attendee was, but I would say if you're not the strongest possible writer you think you can be in this moment, ask why not and how do I become stronger? Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. I'm going to move to the next question. Um, uh, this is from uh, an anonymous attendee. Um, say, um, Ms. Johnson, I want to hear more about that Mississippi faith and how mm -hmm. that faith helped to sustain you. Um, how did it empower you to be the woman that you are today? Well, um, that was the foundation because it truly was a, it was a strong foundation of faith uh, from, from parents who, li who literally, we, we did so. My family gave me, my parents gave me a gift and that gift was, I don't have the best singing voice, but that singing during hard times in those cotton fields, when those bowls would get to hurting our fingers, we'd always start singing spiritual songs. And it was just something about singing and especially singing spiritual songs that made the labor not be so hard. And that would serve me well when I went to prison because I sang a lot in prison. Sang walking the track, sang taking a shower, singing when, my, when I could finally get a moment of peace in my room by myself, I would sing. Doing hard times I sing. So it was really my faith that carried me on. And I, I, I just hope that we don't forget about our faith. Sometimes it becomes really unpopular to say, well, in this, when I came out, I was really shocked really when I came out of prison because sometimes it, became, it was really unpopular to say that I'm a woman of faith, that I'm a Christian, but that's something that I'm not ashamed of because that is really how I got through my time in prison. Thank you. And this is, I think, maybe connected um, um, to that, um, but in a different way. This is from uh, Jolene uh, Devers, who asks, um, how has writing helped you through your struggles? And did you become a writer during your incarceration? I was, I, they discovered when I was 10 years old that I could write. I had a writing assignment. And uh, from that, my teachers were parading me around to other classes so they could hear this poem that I had written and they started entering me in contests with the, with the uh, junior high and I was only 10 years old and I won. And so in prison, I've always found that to pour out whatever I'm feeling through my pen on paper, it was healing for me. So I wrote a lot in prison. Uh, I wrote plays, I wrote many, uh, I wrote articles for papers. I did so many things with writing, but writing has always been a natural part of who I am. And it was, it was a way to express myself and for me to get it on paper and somehow to even reread my own writings to myself, it would give me healing. I'm, I'm talking to myself, I'm writing, I'm writing, but I'm reading back and it's like, I'm encouraging myself, I'm expressing myself, I'm pouring out my pain, I'm pouring out my hopes, my dreams, I'm pouring it all out through the pen. So. But writing for me has, has truly been a huge blessing to help me get through dark times and good times and help me to continue on with good times. Okay. And there's actually another question that Ms. Johnson actually um, gave, gave an answer to this question, but this is a chance for, for you, uh, Mitchell, to answer as well. Um, it, 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 the question is, will both authors share when they started writing? And is it something that they started before or after they were incarcerated? So. Ms. Johnson already effectively answered that question, but Mitchell, I think this is an opportunity for you to give your own experience. Yeah, um, I, um, like Alice, wrote uh, when I was young, a lot of journaling, um, probably mostly about kind of childhood traumas, not that I was a completely traumatized child, but I found myself writing most when something was bothering me. Um, and I don't even really remember it, except that when I was an adult, my mom pulled out some notebooks and showed me um, but I wouldn't consider myself a writer, even though I started writing my first novel while I was incarcerated. Like the, I, I paroled with probably 50 or 60 loose leaf pages of what I thought would become a book. And it actually did become a book. I wouldn't say that I considered myself a writer until I was actually published. Um, and, and also because I think when you say you're a writer, like that's a part of your identity. It's not 
just something you do. It's, it's something you are. Mm-hmm. And uh, it took me a really long time to accept that that was a part of who I was. And, and once I did, there's a kind of commitment, you know, because you can't just say you're a writer and then like half ass the commitment to doing that, um, which also means that you want to become the best possible writer you are. So I think, you know, some people write, but when you say you're a writer or you're a poet, I think that's something else that means that you've taken another step. Um, next question. Um, this is returning to the the experience of, of incarceration. I think this is for uh, Ms. Johnson, but I, 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 I suppose both of you could, could address it as well. Um, you talked about how important it was for you to remain hopeful while you were incarcerated. What do you think helped you maintain your sense of empathy for the warden and others in general? You know, just really looking at them as individuals. I looked at one of the things that I committed to was when I first came into prison, I have never asked the person, why are you here? I gave, it was a blank page for me. I'm going to know you as to how I know who you are right now. And I'm going to respect you and and the same way that I want to be respected. And that I passed that on, not only to the women who I was incarcerated with, but the staff. And I found that they were just human beings. Sometimes uh, that was just a facade because they felt like they had to be a certain way. And believe it or not, I've even counseled staff before. They found me as a person who uh, could be a good sounding board because I always say confidential. And I, I never, I, I never, when people would come to me with issues they had, they knew that that was a safe place. I would always use this term, don't worry, it's in the vault. <laughs> uh, one of the, a recent question asked um, of you, Ms. Johnson, um, what was your path to getting a literary agent? When I came out, um, I, I knew I wanted to write. I, has, I still have so much material. You know, we know that a book cannot contain a memoir. They really can't. It only contains uh, pieces of your life uh, and pieces of things that took place. Um, but my path was not a hard path the way, as I said, because I came out with a lot of notoriety. Uh, I had those who were seeking asking if I was interested, if I would allow them. And I had to really sort through what agency I wanted to sign with. So I, you know, my, I, I, you know, I, I'm really blessed in that I did not have that, that harder path because I think that it was very important that my book came out quickly because there were some things that needed to be passed. There were some things, um, you know, we, we're in this time that everyone is starting to realize that criminal justice reform is not something we just talk about anymore. We have to be about it. And so my, my book really gave a snapshot into not just what is wrong, but how an ordinary, it, it's my life. It's, it's not just about prison, it's my memoir. It's about my, not only my hopes and dreams, but the hopes and dreams of other women and men and my family. And the next phase is going to be even more incredible than the first book. Because what I've been able to do is, it makes no sense. And only because people have seen these things, that's the only way they believe them. But many don't know the inside uh, inside story of how these things even took place. So I'm really excited for my next chapter, for my next book. Uh, as I say, I was very blessed that I didn't have to struggle to uh, to find someone who would uh, publish my book. Harper Collins uh, sought me out, and some others did too. Thank you for that. This is, I think, a really interesting question. Um, uh, what are the top three methods or strategies that social groups, churches, civic groups, etc., can engage families? So they do not need to experience this horrible system. Oh my goodness. Let me think of what I will consider just off the top of my head. I will say, if you see someone that is struggling, uh, it, I'm not talking about just financially struggling. I'm saying, if you're seeing someone that is struggling, that is going down another path, we can't say that, well, glad it's not me. 
That's not our family. It's not going to impact us. But maybe we need to stop the churches also, especially they have a responsibility in this too, because the churches, our whole is redemption. Our whole thing is built upon grace and redemption. And sometimes we look at people, you know, as I said, that I never asked any, anyone what they did. I looked at them as that point. But sometimes we need to not put labels and call kids some bad kids. But we need to see what is the root cause of what, why they're acting out the way they're acting out. And when families have someone who goes to prison, it, it has been a huge thing of shame in the past where that family has been ostracized and the church don't reach out to see, has not sometimes in the past reached out. Once again, they're just glad it's not my family, but you never know when it's going to be your family because it's a net that is thrown pretty, pretty, pretty wide and it does not discriminate who that net falls on or what families it falls upon. But the, and even when people return from prison, we have returning citizens. Too often our churches don't reach out to that person to embrace them and welcome them back in. But once again, they're looked at even sometimes with fear because you've got that label of being an ex-felon or a convict, an ex-convict. So those type of labels really push us farther away from each other. There's another question that I think seems to be related to, to that one and to, in, in some ways to, to the answer that you just gave. Um, the, the, the questioner asks, um, what could have made the difference in, in, in you making different choices? I think this is, this is actually just to both of you. Education, relationships, career opportunities, faith, family. Have you been able to communicate these alternative choices to others to help them make different choices? Or do you feel that your situations were part of your destiny, thus allowing you to be here tonight to speak to us using your incarceration as your platform? Uh, I like that word destiny. Remember, uh, you know, there was a century when America thought it was their manifest destiny to take all the land uh, west <laughs> from natives, and it didn't matter how they did it or how many lives they murdered. Um, I don't think it was my destiny to go to prison, but I do think it's paradoxical that once I got there, it felt like an unbelievable um, happening in my life and also an inevitability. Um, but that inevitability was shaped, uh, you know, Alice talks about 1971, which is four years before I was born, and the beginning of the, quote, war on drugs, which we cannot disconnect from, you know, Nixon and the Southern strategy or gold, Barry Goldwater and the Southern strategy, which we cannot disconnect from, um, you know, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and Reconstruction, right? So like, these are not manifest destinies. These are shaped destinies, right? Which is not disconnected from, you know, integration and poor school systems, which is not disconnected from redlining. So the crazy, I don't think the crazy thing, I think the thing is that the people who are most affected by this are struggling so, they're so far underwater that they can't see the surface. And the surface are all of these policies. And, you know, if we look right now, one thing that I think all of us should be, uh, I don't know, I can't stress enough, um, we should all be paying attention to all these laws. I have not been paying attention to Texas, but I would not doubt that Texas being the place that's responsible for Juneteenth is also enacting some laws to disenfranchise black and brown and poor people and people of color. So to me, that's where we should be focusing our efforts because we're gonna come around to an election cycle and uh, it's gonna be a lot of people that won't be able to vote. And also if we think about, I think it was Texas where the woman tried to vote and got five years in a federal penitentiary for, for making a mistake on trying on making a mistake on trying to vote. So I think uh, we could very well have an increase in mass incarceration connected to this idea of voting and disenfranchisement. So uh, I think we should put a lot of effort towards that. And no, I don't think it was my destiny to go to prison, but I can see now how it was shaped for me. I, I, I too, I agree 
with what Mitchell just said, there are a lot of a lot of different reasons why people end up in prison. But many of the many of them, too many of them, is education and opportunity. Um, I know that. I'll say this. God didn't put me in prison. He didn't need me to go to prison for these things to happen in my life. But what I can say that once that happened, then it was turned around for something good to come out of it. Something good did come out of my going to prison. And that something good was, I literally put a face to the need for criminal justice reform. I think that before I came out, it was hard to imagine a 63 year old grandmother and someone like myself equated with the stereotype that has been out there about prisoners. And it was able to just really up in the people's faces as they read my story and they saw the time that I received and what my past had been before and really what the crime was that I committed to land me such a hard sentence. It, it woke people up and made people start thinking that if this can happen to her, let us, let us re-examine what do we need to change. We had a bill that was really kind of stuck and that was the First Step Act. But my coming out really put calls brought by partisan support to come together because this is not a partisan issue. It's not a social issue. It is a human humanitarian issue. We are in a crisis right now. So, you know, to say destiny, I, I can say that I was destined to do what I'm doing now. I can say that, but I don't think that when I was born and they spanked me and they said <laughs> that this one is going to go to prison yeah. and she's going to be like our, like our young Moses. Let's go hide her. Let's go, <laughs> let's go sell her down the river and hide her for 21 years. No, but once, once these things happen to me, I do know that that is part of my destiny that I am to be a, uh, an agent of change. And I'm going to let Bryn Price have the last question, which is, do you have any recommendations for any other books to learn about this societal issue? <laughs> well, I would say uh, you've got a local, you've got a local author there, Brittany Barnett, A Knock at Midnight, it's an excellent book. And I say that not only because she was one of the attorneys on my team, but uh, she, she, she really has done a very good job in breaking down some of, these, uh, some of these issues that we're facing. So I would say start at home right there in Dallas, SMU, um, SMU former student and get Brittany Barnett's book. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's the end of our q and A. I'm going to now turn things over to back to Sandria Smith. But before I do, I just want to, to thank both of you for a really enlightening dialogue um, and, and your, your very generous answers to, uh, to, the, to the audience and its questions. Thank you so much. Thank Sandra. you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I knew this would be excellent. And I've just been sitting here mesmerized listening to both of you. And I know Mitchell, I've been knowing him for a long time and he's, he's always showed up for us in Dallas, but I appreciate you showing up for us as well, Alice, and had the opportunity. I've known Alice's family for a long, long time. Her, her family member and my brother played football together at Arkansas uh, State University. So uh, thank you for being here. And I tell people, I told Mitchell this when I met you, Alice, that I thought you were anointed. So uh, it, was, it was a pleasure to have the opportunity to meet you a couple of weeks ago. Oh, thank you. My daughter loves you and now I love <laughs> you. And please come on down to Mississippi. Let me show you the, the new improved Mississippi. You know I'll be over there. Okay. And my cousin teaches at Jackson State too. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll be there. But, uh, but we have more, if you guys enjoy it tonight, we have more for you tomorrow, starting at 10 a.m. Central Time. And uh, we're, we, we start out with Let's Talk Woman to Woman. 
that doesn't mean that men can't show up as well. We're also honoring one of our most esteemed authors here and activists. I don't know if he would say that, Ben Fountain at noon. Uh, and on Sunday, we'll be honoring uh, a true activist, literary activist, Emma Rogers, and that's at noon as well. But we have, if, please go to dallasliterayfestival.org and uh, register to continue to hear these wonderful authors. We also have our poet laureate tomorrow as well, uh, Joy Harjo. And I don't know if you heard her on uh, Oprah's uh, Super Soul Sunday, but she's gonna be even better uh, tomorrow with, uh, uh, in her conversation with Katie Condon. So please, uh, please join us tomorrow and Sunday for some of these events. If you haven't signed up, please do so. We wanna thank everyone that's here tonight. We've done tons of work to try to bring to you uh, something that would represent the era that we're in right now. And we call the title Turbulence. And so please give, um, if I was, if you guys were in person, I would give you a hug. <laughs> would love to, but uh, soon, hopefully soon. But thank you, and please continue to join us for the rest of the festival. All right. Thank you so much.